Very good. Okay. General Sunik Parker, welcome to PA Consulting's Millnet podcast. As we approach Armed Forces Week, we're having conversations with veterans about their time serving, but also about their time uh, after their service. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning to talk to us. It's a real pleasure, uh, and I've been really looking forward to this conversation. No, it's a pleasure for me, Reese. Thanks. I, I'd like to jump straight in at the deep end, if we can, and take you back to 2009, 2010, when you were serving as Deputy Commander ISAF under General Stan McChrystal. Now, the, the history books and the media have this period of time pretty well documented from, a, from the point of view of the military campaign and the politics at the time. But can you take us behind the scenes into the life of Nick Parker? What, what pressures did you personally feel most keenly back then? And, and how did you shape your daily routine and, and what was really at the forefront of your mind at that time? I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I suppose I'm almost a professional deputy. Uh, the number of times I seem to have done it at the at the, at the operational level, um, and when because I, I did it in Afghanistan, I did it in Iraq, and sort of did it with the Olympics because one was so much in support of the police uh, or local. So I've got very used to working as the um, supporting act rather than the big ego. Um, what you find in those circumstances is that the, the key thing is to develop the relationship with the principal. Because actually, I mean, if you think back to all the times when you've had a deputy, um, they can be a real pain. And you can quite easily cut them out and just jump down into the executive. So my job at that time was to make it clear to the to McChrystal and particularly to the staff that I had some value to add. Um, and so one was working quite hard to muscle in on conversations, but without being seen to be being the pain, who the needy one. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I, I mean, I, it's actually quite enjoyable in a way. It can be very frustrating. It's quite, it's quite nervous to start with that you're just going to end up being an added extra. And if I could just flash back to Baghdad, um, when when I was the deputy corps commander to a, a fantastic guy called J.R. Vines, but he was an archetypal um, you know, chin forward military commander, and he was under huge pressure. And the last thing that he wanted was some slightly effete British ponce wandering around, sort of getting in his way. And and I. I found then that it was almost less the problem with him, but it was how the hell did you get on with the staff? Because ultimately, the people who do the things, you can shape the commander's thinking, but actually you have to be trusted by the staff. And bizarrely, JR left on his two weeks R&R, &R, about three weeks after I arrived, and the boss in Iraq, um, Casey, George Casey, the moment JR's plane had left the runway on his R&R, &R, rang me up and said, I want to do an operation um, into Anbar, Anwar to, um, uh, to to secure the Euphrates Valley uh, for the elections. And of course, the staff had been pushing back against this while JR was there, and JR had been supporting it. Casey wanted it to be done, and so turned around and told me to do it. And suddenly, I was sitting looking at the staff telling them to do something that their boss had told them not to do. And it was a very, I, I, over that period, it was a very interesting experience for me to learn how to deal with staff and bring them on site, which, which we did, um, largely by sharing the responsibility, by, by you know, shifting the responsibility to all of us. Um, and in, in Afghanistan, Stan had a very tight staff, very tight, very loyal, very tight. Um, he brought a number of people with him, um, who all highly competent, but very focused on the commander. So that period of sort of late 2009, um, my job was to be seen to be adding value in areas where, actually, candidly, where Stan didn't want to play, and he didn't particularly want to play in the 
diplomatic stuff that was going on in Kabul. Um, mm. he, he didn't want to have to manage all the interests of um, the various coalition partners. He was very happy for me to act as the sort of NATO lead and leave him to be able to concentrate on Washington. And after a bit, one began to establish the necessary relationships to, to make him and his staff realize that that was what was happening. But it was frustrating sometimes. Sometimes you didn't think you were, make, you were getting anywhere. You know on an operation when people are, you know, big things happen, you have to pick your moment um, to say something, to, to, uh, to attract Stan's attention, to, to make the joke that will let everybody relax, that sort of thing. You God, you have to be careful when you do that. And the only other point I would make, which is, and I'm, you're now going to get a, a whiff of bitterness, is going to creep into the conversation. But I was deeply frustrated by London, who who didn't respect Kabul or or the headquarters of ISAF. They were fixated on Helmand. They could not see the breadth of the campaign and the need to see it from a, a campaign, an operational perspective, a theatre perspective. And so I was also in parallel, and this was very, very frustrating, trying to get London to understand that they shouldn't ring the brigadier in Helmand every Monday to find out what was going on in order to brief the chiefs of staff on the cabinet. They should ring the deputy commander in Kabul, who was also the national contingent commander. And that's that's not about ego. That is just about getting the perspective right. And that was very frustrating. You asked me a question about personal habits, um, I, uh, which is really important. And, and you need when you've got nobody as your direct superior, you've got to be careful that you don't overwork. I find the Americans tended to overwork. Um, they, they used to get up very early in the morning, run, have breakfast, work, work, work. And by six o'clock, they were all yawning. Um, then they stayed up because they had to stay up because that was when they started connecting with Washington until two, three in the morning, and they were up again at five. So they were knackered. Um, my routine was to, if I if I, I could sustain six hours a night indefinitely sleep, uh, I could only do four hours a night for about a week, and then one needed to have a break. So I used to try and get six hours a night, exercise every morning first thing um, if one wasn't out uh, and try to take half a day off a week to go and walk up a hill or you know just do something if it was possible to do it, uh, but to get away from it all. Um, and every night before I went to bed, I used to go and have a fag in the garden outside the headquarters if I was in Kabul and just chat to the, the personal staff, just sort of about other stuff. Um, and, and my personal, it's like the, the staff immediately around me were incredibly important to me. A military assistant, there was a chief of staff and uh, a guy who sort of kept sure, made sure that I was being fed and that sort of thing. And they were mm. incredibly important to just sort of talk normally to about normal stuff. That's that's really interesting. Thank you. And, I, and you know, we're seeing that more and more now, how the... the the shadow that the leader casts is is incredibly important when it comes to a welfare point of view of the people that work up to them. Um, if 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 they're the kind of person that's that's working all night, sending emails every hour of the day, people feel an obligation to respond, um, and you can only keep up that tempo for for so long. So it is it is important to to be able to relax and and, and show that that's okay. Yeah. Um, in the summer of 2010, General Stan resigned quite suddenly, and you became, for a, for a short period of time, the, the commander of all NATO troops in Afghanistan. How did you hear the news of McChrystal's resignation? Where were you, and, and what were the things that immediately went through your mind? The first time I had, I hadn't spotted the Rolling Stone stuff being the interviews going on. I mean, it was, it was all at that time of the dust cloud and all of that. And I knew that they had been off um, in Paris and, and they'd done a European tour to try and to stump up more, to get the European nations to stump up more troops. But I wasn't aware that it was going on. I wasn't aware that it was going to go into the magazines. And it all happened very quickly. And I know they were sent a draft of the article. Um, 
which, and I didn't know about any of this. It was all kept very tight. Um, and then uh, st st I actually Stan was sitting outside the headquarters on the steps and I, I went and had a chat with him and he said, I think we've got a bit of a problem um, that this is going to be published. We, we've tried to sort of influence the way it's shaped to, so it's more balanced. Uh, but he said, I think you know, things are going to get difficult. And uh, about 24 hours later, he was called back by the chairman uh, to, to Washington to brief. And we, we didn't know what was going to the, the extent of that briefing, but he knew that there was trouble. Um, I suppose one of the one of the reassuring things about all of this is if you do have a second in command or a deputy who is reasonably well integrated into the system, um, this is no big deal. You know, he could have gone away for two weeks R and R, and the ship would have gone on sailing in the same direction. I mean, my job was to make sure that the ship sailed in the same direction. We didn't do a sort of violent left turn. So, so I, I think when when I was told that he had resigned. I, the, the events that unfold, the staff were all sitting in the situational awareness room um, at about 10 o'clock at night, watching the monitors of the, what was going on outside the White House and then the announcement of the resignation and the appointment of Petraeus. And um, the staff who I have already alluded to are, were very close to him, um, were... Uh, following every word and were quite shocked. Um, and I, rem I remember there, there was, it, it was 10, 11, it was at 10, 11 o'clock at night. We were all knackered. They were all sitting there looking very glam. And I told them to bugger off to bed. I think those were my words. Bugger off to bed. Um, you know, do not worry. His legacy will live on. Some words to that effect. All we've got to do now is just to keep doing what we're doing. Now go away and go to bed and have some sleep. And and they it, that was <laughs> was quoted back to me. It wasn't carefully thought through, but it was quoted back to me about you know, a couple of months later that it had had an effect of just sort of calming everybody down and, and couldn't remove the hurt or the sense of um, bewilderment that there was, but it did calm everybody down and it sort of it made people stop and start looking at what they had to do rather than worrying about the context that was around them to the same degree. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I suppose if one had, I, I, if it was instinctive, but it was um, lucky that I did it. Um, and then, and then, as I say, you know, when, I mean, I was rung up by the prime minister, by David Cameron the next morning. Oh, I, is everything all right? You know, and I, there was nothing wrong. The, the ship just carried on sailing, and it was a highly competent operation. You know, Dave, Dave Rodriguez was sort of doing; he was doing all the stuff. It was it was just a question of man, managing relationships during the transition. Um, and because people knew that Dave Petraeus was coming, there was you know, it, it, it was no big deal. So, it I think what I'm saying to you is, it although it sounds as if it was the most exciting moment of my life. It, it wasn't really. You, you mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, I think I think you used the words of nervous at the start in terms of establishing relationships and getting getting embedded into the team, um, demonstrating that that credibility. Did what, what what was playing on your mind prior to Petraeus coming in, and how did you prepare for that um, that first briefing? I had known Dave in um, Iraq uh, when he was the trainer um, and had a reasonable relationship with him then. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't concerned about the personal relationship. <clears throat> I, knew, I knew that he was a very big dog. You know, he had you know, been CENTCOM. He'd done stuff which meant that this was effectively um, a step down. Um, so I was a, a little bit concerned about how it was going to sort of fit in. Um, but 
I actually just told them to prepare briefings as if they were briefing the crystal. So you know, just just brief your current plan, and then it will change. But mm -hmm. um, but at least they know the level that you're starting at. And uh, I, all, all all I remember uh, it took about ten days for all the sort of. Uh, Congress, congressional stuff to, to happen. I remember as he was flying in, he rang me from his aeroplane and just said, I'm, I'm flying over Bahrain. Um, any reason for me to drop in and have a word with the, the, the boss here? You know, because he, at which he knew all the big people in the region. Um, and it, it, it made me realize that we were, we were about to deal with a very different sort of commander both of them hugely competent but very different sort of people um here we had a gen someone with genuine strategic experience at the very highest level and in stan we had somebody with genuine operational effective success um uh, but they were different and it made me realize that we were going to have to behave a bit differently mm -hmm. you you mentioned your your frustrations with London, um, and their focus on on Helmand. Back then, the the commander of Task Force Helmand, uh, then Brigadier, uh, now General, retired. Uh, James Cowan was was commanding there. Um, we heard this week the the tragic news from the Halo Trust the humanitarian mine clearance organization that 10 of their staff had been murdered and 16 injured by an Islamic state attack. Um, James Cowan is, is the CEO of that organization. And he, he, he gave a very moving um, uh, speech yesterday, I think on, on their organization and the work that they do. I think it's a, a really stark reminder of the challenges that the country still faces. What, what do you think the immediate, future holds for Afghanistan? And are you in any way optimistic? My first, I think the first part I made, my heart goes out to James and to the families of all of those people who Afghans have been killed. Um, but, uh, and I think, I, I mean, I, I would hope that James senses the wave of sympathy and support that is around him um, he's doing an extremely important, difficult job. Doing it, I'm doing it extreme, very well. But but these sorts of events are so horrible and uncalled for that um, I hope he does feel this sort of sense of support from all of us. Um, <laughs> we've invested a hell of a lot of our, our lives in Afghanistan. Um, the way I, 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 and I do think about this, and that you can tell from my stuttering response to your question that there's something lurking here. Um, I feel very strongly that the people who gave their lives or who were injured as a result of that uh, operation should feel deeply proud of the way we behave. We learnt in ex extraordinarily challenging circumstances, how to deal with an enemy that wasn't like anything we'd really encountered before in an environment which was very alien to us. And I, I pers my, my personal feeling is a feeling of extraordinary pride for the British forces throughout the whole period of our time in Helmand. And if you look at the way in the early days, the Paris had to adapt and and, and they did it brilliantly, but it, they adapted and we were constantly adapting. And every time we got a whack on the chin, we managed to shake our heads and get back in there and supported by fantastic procurement, really innovative logistic solutions. So, so as a professional soldier, I think we did a brilliant job in extraordinarily challenging circumstances and we did what we were asked to do. And for that reason, as a professional, it was worth it. When you then step back from that and you look at it 
at another Western intervention into a extraordinarily challenging security situation where now it, it whatever way you dress it up it looks like the wild west and the wild west very similar to 1999 um you do question how effective we were and you question what is being in the long term so that how effective was our effective intervention between 2001 and 2014 um what's plugged the gap afterwards and and what is the western world or the the international community's desire to do anything other than military intervention where's the socio-economic interventions that are culturally sensitive to the country that you're concerned about and we my view is that we simply haven't got a model that allows that to be effective um and i think that should concern us that should if if global security is in all of our interests, the models that we've been using for the hard S part of security may have been okay to produce a very basic foundation, but they haven't been effective in allowing people then to build a house that's appropriate to the place that you're building on top of that foundation. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I think a lot of a lot of the veteran community will will um, take comfort in in those words. We we did what we were asked to do, and we did it well. Um, and I think, you know, Reese, I think, and I mean, I'm not looking to, to sort of um, sugar a pill. I think it's sad, and I think it's very unnerving that ISIS IS is lurking now. I mean, what was all that bollocks we were told? We're doing what we're doing in Afghanistan is going to make the streets of london safer that was the that was the narrative and it never rang true um and but we did as a professional army it's a subtle difference here if you were if you were um raised from the people as a conscript army to protect the state it would be a different matter but we weren't we were a professional army being to are a professional army being told to go off and do something and we did it bloody well mm. I, I remember back in 2010, Gordon Brown, then Prime Minister, coming out to Lashkar, giving a speech to the headquarters there and saying those exact words. We were there keeping the streets of Britain safer and the 250, 300 people there listening, uh, you could tell, you know, that just didn't sit well with anyone. I mean, interestingly, when I, I subsequently, I went to do a, a commission for a charity on Islam and its participation in public life in Britain. And one of the things, we went all around the country and chatting to people. And one of the things that just didn't ring true with these communities was that our foreign policy was honest because they didn't believe it either. And they thought it was an adventure into another cultural area to try and impose our own cultural, um, uh, view, our own cultural sort of emphasis on them. And of course, that wasn't the case, but that was the way it was interpreted because it was not a compelling mm. narrative. Yeah. Indeed, and, and compelling narratives are, of course, crucial in, in galvanizing a team behind a, an objective and, and one as, as complex and as difficult as that. Um, you, you, you just have to um, you know, hope that, that that can be crafted and, and it does ring true with people. Otherwise, you're going to be off to a, um, you know, a, difficult, a difficult start. I'd like to fast forward a few years, Nick, and, and your time... Uh, after leaving the military, you you were involved from a very early stage with setting up Team Rubicon in the UK. Perhaps you can just just give give some context behind Team Rubicon and what and what it does as an organisation. And then, um, can you talk about how you first became involved and and um, uh, why why you felt compelled to do that? Yeah, Team Rubicon was set up by two uh, ex-retired uh, US um, soldiers. After the Haiti earthquake in 2010, they gathered together a group of people, some doctors from Chicago. They went to Haiti in amongst the chaos. They found that they were able to deliver some really significant immediate response to the disaster. They then set this charity up, Team Rubicon in the USA, and uh, it is now huge and very focused on internal 
Okay, there, there are so many disasters, natural disasters in that huge landmass of uh, North America. They're, they're busy, busy um, fighting fires and dealing with tornadoes and all that sort of stuff. I heard about it when I left the army. I was uh, one of the things that uh, the itch, one of the itches that had to be scratched was that the narrative was all about poor, poor, vet, poor soldiers, poor veterans, pity, pity them. They need support. And there was less resonating, a less resonant, resonant narrative about how the the veteran community has a massive amount of potential. And um, I went to a symposium in Canada House in London, where this guy stood up and started talking about Team Rubicon. It happened to be Jake Wood, one of the founders. Um, and I thought that's very interesting. And he name dropped Dave Petraeus halfway through his talk as a uh, one of the patrons. So I sent Dave a text sitting at the back of the room and said, is this bloke kosher? And uh, got a text back before he'd finished speaking saying, yep, he's all right. Um, so I went up to him afterwards and uh, said, "What could is this something which could be sort of taken internationally? And they were having some conversations about forming an international arm, um, which they did. Uh, one of the conditions that we made was that we were prepared to operate under license, but it had to be an independent organization operating under UK charity law. Um, and uh, over time, it became clear that it's very difficult to operate like that. So we have, um, with the greatest respect between the two organizations, rebranded during the course of the last year, and we're now called REACT, um, and, and operating very much on the same core principles that we, come, that we got from Team Rubicon, but adapted to better suit the sort of culture and circumstances in the UK. Yeah, an incredible organization. And uh, I know it was involved heavily well, over the past 18 months with the, the COVID response. What are, your, what are your thoughts on how React has been able to mobilize the people it has and, and the effect that it's delivered in the UK? Um, well, it took us a bit by surprise. Um, and we have... The, the charity has now really been operating con continuously for the last just over a year, which has been quite challenging because we were designed to, to go in bursts after a disaster, send a small group of people to, to have an immediate effect and then bug out when the big uh, organisations came in to do recovery. So it's been a bit of a challenge. Um, I, I mean, when you look at the whole picture we are a drop in the ocean but um the things that we've done in the places that we've done them have made a huge difference so behind in the red zone of about seven nhs trust hospitals helping in intensive care with proning temporary mortuary sites in the early stages when the body can't got too much of the existing system to work um do, do, the rapid testing, the surge testing, all of these things we've been involved in. Increasingly trying to concentrate our skilled responders in the areas of organization so that we can bring together other other charitable organizations to make a more consistent, have a, have a more consistent effect. Um, and I think that's our, our view is that the the most extraordinary thing that's happened during COVID, which isn't probably sp spoken about enough, is the, the huge amount of community volunteering that goes on. Um, that, that in any part of the country, there are wonderful organizations like Rotary Clubs and Lions and, and just local committees that bring together um, people in communities who have been helping. And that has been the extraordinary thing, which hasn't been tapped enough. But what helps is when it's coordinated and when you produce something that acts as an interlocutor between it, this mass of volunteer, willingness to volunteer, and you need an interlocutor between that and whoever is defining the requirement. And I think that's what we have learned as being something which we can do quite well. You mentioned a minute ago that you, you wanted to change the narrative around veterans and, and society's view of, of veterans from you know poor veterans we must look after them to something else yeah. a lot's been done i think in the past 
five plus years to change that narrative. And we have the Armed Forces Covenant and, and, and many blue chip organizations are our um, our members and support that. What what do you think still needs to be done um, by all parties, really, by by people still serving in the military, by veterans themselves and by organizations large and small across the country? I think I think there is a need for still a need for a cultural shift. I mean, the Armed Forces, Armed Forces Covenant is great. It's still a bit patronizing. I mean, we can use it as an effective lever to to make sure that we get the best possible deal as a veteran community. But I, I have to say, my I, I don't want to be supported by the government. Why should we? Why can't we come together as a hugely innovative, large, I mean, what is it? It's one, one million of us, well, I can't say us, one million veterans are under 65. Um, and, uh, and in that, the vast majority are doing okay. Some are doing brilliantly, and some are having real difficulty. That's where the focus has been. In my opinion, the focus should be on those who are doing okay, help them do a bit better. So that mm -hmm. at the bottom of that pile of success, fewer people drop down into the needing help and more go up into the proving the skills that they've got and making a huge success of their lives and their families' lives. Um, and, that, and that, to me, is still something which conceptually the, the veteran community needs to own. Um, I don't, don't need to be told what to do by the ministers and the, the Office for Veterans in the Ministry of Defence. Great to have them there. Great to have them supporting us. But surely it should be us who take the hard take, take the hard yards of making the most out of our community. And I guess on that on that note, your your latest venture um, aims to perhaps address that TXNet. Yeah. Can you can you talk about TXNet and, and and what it brings to the veteran community, or, or perhaps what it, what it allows the veteran community to to do. I mean, it it will mature over time, but at the moment, the idea is very basic. That, <coughs> as, as you know, all of us use our connections to either get something that we need or help somebody who comes to us. We're all doing it all the time, um, and we should be able to do this as part of a broader network because um, if I have, I have a limited network and if somebody comes to me wanting help, it'd be a heck of a sight better for that person if I was then able to put them in touch with a far wider network that has a far greater chance of giving them what they need or, or taking what they have to offer. So TXNet is a very, at the moment, a very basic digital platform that takes somebody with a have, something they have, connects them with somebody who needs something and makes sure that that connection happens. And importantly, we have a human watching the connection to make sure that it's not just digital, it's given a nudge if nothing happens. Um, and I mean, it sounds silly this, but over time, I see it as having a sort of Uber, Airbnb future because you will be able to apply algorithms to it which will will start to to really leverage the digital capacity of a network like that not as a social it's not a social network it's not for chatting it's for leveraging what people want and need and offering them opportunity which they might otherwise not not have um, we we've deliberately started it as a, a minimum viable product we don't I, we don't want big investors forcing us to apply objectives to meet their requirements. We want the objectives to be set by us um, so that we can grow this thing in a way that is consistent with what the members want and, and, and continues to stay true to the principle of connecting people. So if Rifleman so-and-so in Lancashire wants to have connection with somebody who uh, can help them to devise some sort of a little business plan at, at a very low level, not at the sort of great PA consulting level, but at a very low level, there's going to be somebody around the corner 
who's had a similar sort of experience, possibly as a plumber or something, in, you know, at a very low level, and they will be able to have a conversation which really hits home because it's linked to experience, it's linked to their, their emotional intelligence, and it's linked to location. And that's where we want to go with this thing, connect people with skills, with ideas, and with place. Well, the, the power of a network of over just around a million uh, veterans under 65 is, is fairly substantial, very substantial. Um, so I would, I would certainly encourage everyone to sign up to TXNet. I have, I know you're looking for those early adopters, like any yeah. initiative, you, you need early adopters to build up that, that, that ground swell and to gain that momentum. Um, so everyone check out TXNet and sign I mean, that's up. True. I, all I'd say, I think, I mean, you are absolutely right. The two things we need are members, and connections so it's got to be credible so we need those who come onto the platform to think about what do i and not it's, we are not all havers we're all needers and havers mm -hmm. uh, and the, for me the best thing is what do, what do i need and then i watch the platform and when i see somebody else who has a need i can think of somebody who has what they wanted that's we need that sort of participation um, we're charging people ten pounds a year, which at your level seems like nothing. At the lower level, you know, there are some people who probably think it's quite a lot. But we we want it to be a paid member affinity group, um, and because it, it is important that we put a little sort of fence round us, so we are defined as a community. But it is not meant to challenge other networks that exist inside the veteran community. I mean the. I had a conversation with a regiment the other day who were worried that this was going to somehow undermine their network. It's not going to in any way contradict the sort of social aspect of those sorts of networks. What it does is it offers them the opportunity. If somebody in their network needs something, there's a pretty strong chance that there's nobody in their network, no matter how big it is, who wants it. But when you go out into the million strong, there'll be a RAF guy who left 20 years ago. Who will have exactly what they want so so let's not be too parochial this breaks the parochial aspects of uh, regimental networks and that sort of thing without yeah, no, you are you are indeed plugging a very specific gap um in the in the in the veteran ecosystem uh we're trying and, to i've just seen four emails but the system for payment went down yesterday so um you know we have our little challenges it's nice to be in a position where i have to try and Men the challenge, although I'm not very good at coding. Or chasing people for money? Oh, terrible. Actually, I'm getting better at that. <laughs> Great. Nick, final question. Um, and, and, you know, I, I could ask many more, but but we have to bring this to a close. The, the work that we do at PA Consulting is all about unlocking ingenuity within our clients' organizations. Across your career, where have you seen ingenuity demonstrated to, to really good effect you you primed me on this question i have fun enough i've been thinking about it a bit um and i I've, I've seen a great deal of ingenuity a great deal of ingenuity i mean you see ingenuity every time a section commander has to work out whether he's going left or right flanking you know, you, you don't always I mean, sometimes you don't see ingenuity. That's the point. But you see people who have the ability to think a bit laterally and 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 work 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 things out in a different way. Uh, the, my answer to your pre-primed in my having thought about it. My answer to your question is: I think it it it, it exists at three levels in my experience. Um, at the very lowest level, it is it is where it is easiest to apply. You can you can be ingenious when you're sitting if you if you see a hierarchical organisation if you're sitting in that that bottom tier where your uh, responsibilities are relatively limited and the stakeholders that you have are also limited and therefore easier to manage you have far greater flexibility to be ingenious. I then I, I, you then find as you go up in an organisation that your your ability to leverage that becomes increasingly difficult. Um, 
Now, clearly, it depends on the circumstances that you're in. If you have a very clearly defined objective that has a priority over everything else, you can afford to exploit ingenuity in a way that you can't when that objective is clouded by the huge sort of bureaucratic morass that exists when you get into the higher levels of an organization. So uh, I was just reflecting, I found it easiest to apply ingenuity as a junior officer. Um, and indeed it was really fun because you got an immediate outcome very often, or you stirred things up. Um, so it was, I, I probably sounds good. Anyway, but you did, you stir things up at the bottom, and therefore I would, I would look to try to find ingenuity where it exists at the bottom of an organization and suck it up rather than trying to inject it into I mean, my last job. There were some wonderful people in Andover, but they had absolutely no incentive to be ingenious. They, they were working hard from, you know, more than nine to five. And the last thing they wanted was some clever clogs coming along with a good idea. So, so actually introducing ingenuity at that level becomes much more difficult. You either have to produce a very clear objective, which nobody can question, which is easier on an operation, not easy at home, or you have to have somebody in charge for five to six to seven years so that they can really reinforce change uh, over a protracted period. And that's exhausting. Yeah. A huge challenge, no doubt, for a lot of people watching this. And, um, you know, often most of the work gets done at the front lines, at, at the kind of levels that you're talking about, where people perhaps do have the freedom to come up with new ideas and be and be ingenious. And I guess, therefore, it's the, the role of, of leadership to give people that freedom of movement and to, to empower them to, to make mistakes and to, um, and to try new things. Yeah. General Sonic Parker, thank you so much for joining me on uh, PA Consulting's Milnet podcast. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for being so so candid about your experiences. Um, all the best with TXNet. Uh, once again, everyone check out TXNet if you haven't already. Um, and I, I look forward to, to hearing about the next chapter.